All right, welcome everyone to the UAB Institute for Human Rights panel discussion entitled Human Rights in Times of COVID-19, Safety versus Individual Liberty? I'm Dr. Tina Kempin reuter and I'm the director of the Institute and I will moderate this important discussion. We will start the panel with a short introduction of our topic and will follow with a conversation on the implications of emergency declarations such as lockdowns, curfews, stay at home orders and some other policies we have seen during the current pandemic for human rights and individual freedoms. We will include answering questions from the community. So if you have any questions or comments, please write them to us in the comment section of this event on the Institute Facebook page or on YouTube, wherever you are following. Uh, welcome to all the viewers. Let me start by introducing our panelists. Uh, first, Dr. Kay Morgan is the director of the UAB African American Studies Program and professor of criminal justice. She's an expert on civil rights, race and crime, and criminal justice policy. Our second panelist is Dr. Natasha Zaretsky. She is a professor of history at UAB. She focuses on contemporary US culture and intersecting histories of women, gender, and families. And finally, our third panelist is Dr. Rob Blanton. He's the chair of the Department of Political Science and Public Administration and a specialist in international human rights. His work has focused on the intersection of international political economy and human rights, as well as human trafficking. Thank you all so much for being here today and for joining our uh, discussion. Uh, let me start our conversation with you, Dr. Morgan. Uh, the tension between safety versus individual liberty is created by the authority of governments uh, to limit individual rights in times of public emergencies like the one we're currently in. What does this mean for civil rights in the United States? Well, we are all granted by the Constitution uh, individual rights or civil liberties. I cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So that says that, you know, even if I commit a crime, that I must have procedural rights, I must have procedural safeguards, and I have a right to a trial by jury, a right to an attorney. But those rights can be deprived if there is a national emergency, uh, when decisions about lives and health uh, affects or endangers the health and safety of others in society, then the government has a society and can certainly impose restrictions on my individual rights. Um, so yeah, there are limitations. Yes, we do have individual rights, but they're not absolute. And we do have some restrictions. And in times of emergencies, as we are experiencing now, the government has a responsibility to impose restrictions on those rights. So if of a pandemic or a coronavirus can be stopped by limiting or restricting individual rights, they are absolutely entitled to do so. It is absolutely constitutional to do so. Thank you. Um, this brings me to you, Dr. Zaretsky. Um, the, there's been a lot of discussion over you know, where this line uh, should be like you know whether these these individual rights are um, I guess the the people are in agreement that they might not be absolute but where exactly that line uh, should be and uh, that you know in American culture and partisanship a lot of it came out in American culture and partisanship could you tell us a little bit about how this has played out sure and I think the first thing to say is just in the broadest terms, there's general agreement that we're living through a uniquely polarizing time in American politics. And I'd say that in the last decade or so, the political polarization that's sometimes described in terms of red state versus blue state or Republicans or Democrats um, has actually intersected with questions about public health. So debates about vaccination, for example, where you see um, mandatory vaccines being pitted against people's right to 
personal choice and individual liberty um, as just one example. So I think that, um, that this is an important thing to stress at the outset, that public health questions are kind of intersecting with the political polarization of our own time. And now we find ourselves in the midst of this pandemic. And I think one of the things that we have to be really asking is how polarized, in fact, is the country around this question of the balance between individual liberties and public health? Because on the one hand, we're seeing these very intense kind of iconic scenes of um, lockdown protesters squaring off against health workers saying we are anti-lockdown, we wanna go out, we want the economy to restart, um, kind of squaring off in places like Denver and Michigan, very much sort of um, speaking out against the lockdown. But it's actually kind of unclear how widespread, how grassroots this movement actually is because polling, the polls are shifting all the time, but as of last month, polling showed that actually the majority of Americans do support social distancing and staying home if they really believe it has a chance of protecting them and their loved ones from getting ill. So I think that um, one of the things we have to do is take seriously, um, you know, there are so many images floating around social media, but I think we're in a moment where it's really hard to gauge what the relationship is between uh, those media images that are proliferating and people's actual opinions. I think it's going to take a long time to sort of sort that out. Thank you. I know this is not just an issue in the United States. Um, like these discussions are happening all around um, the world. And so I want to ask you, Dr. Blank, Blank and how what you can tell us about this tension between safety and liberty uh, from an international human rights or international politics perspective? Sure, thanks. Yeah, from an international human rights perspective, uh, it's broadly recognized that states can sometimes use these emergency powers to protect the public good. And yeah, the response to the pandemic is, is no exception to this. Now, in balancing these things, I mean, international law does provide a relatively intuitive set of standards. Restrictions need to be necessary, proportionate, and non-discriminatory in nature. You know, which means you know, an actual threat has to exist, the response should not go beyond resolving the immediate problem, and the response has to be implemented in a fair and impartial manner. And, and also another thing which gets at some of the struggles is certain aspects of human rights, uh, personal and physical integrity rights, you know, freedom from torture, freedom from arbitrary imprisonment, extrajudicial killings and all, those remain absolute throughout. That is, it's never permissible to use policies such as arbitrary arrest or the violent repression of labor movements or torture you know, under the guise of emergency powers. So that's, that's kind of the ideal, right? This sort of ideal thing. In terms of how well that matches the reality of the situation, you know, it's pretty problematic. And just even a brief survey of current events you know, reveals some, some big departures here. I mean, from the onset, even the necessity of responding to COVID-19 was problematic. Right. In this case, the issue wasn't so much as states creating a false emergency, so much as states denying an emergency existed. And China's a big example here. But even you know, recently, I mean, the U.S. and Brazil, government leaders were skeptical about COVID-19 and even you know, whether it was an emergency. And they still second guess most every recommendation put forth by the experts in this area. And there's also been problems with proportionality and non-discrimination elements. Uh, a lot of countries have used the pandemic as an excuse to either undermine the rule of law or to undermine democratic processes. And, and a big example here is the uh, so-called coronavirus coup in Hungary, right, in which uh, President Viktor Orban used the pandemic basically to take over uh, as an autocrat. He suspended elections and now he has the power uh, to rule by decree for an indefinite amount of time. And uh, other less extreme examples, there's no shortage of cases where other countries are using this as an excuse to undermine civil society in other ways. Uh, Thailand, Cambodia, Turkey, for example, have used emergency powers as a rationale for detaining anyone who remotely criticizes the government's response to the crisis. That includes journalists, activists, and even healthcare workers. Um, there's similar problems with discrimination. I mean, one example in that, uh, 57 countries have closed their borders uh, to all refugees, uh, which sometimes means that you have to return people to dangerous situations within, our, within their home country. And uh, finally, there are no shortage of cases for, you know, where necessary policy responses have resulted in unnecessary violations of human rights. 
Uh, the Philippines has enforced curfew and even social distancing laws through widespread arrests and abuses. Uh, and other countries have used similarly oppressive means, such as imprisonment and even the use of lethal force to, to uh, enforce lockdowns. Uh, so this is a pretty depressing litany of stuff. And what it really shows, and this is something that, that's common when you study human rights, right? While the ideal is pretty straightforward, uh, it's not often put into practice. So I can offer some sort of suggestions uh, to resolve this struggle. I don't think I can say anything definitive, you know, but it does show, I, I would argue that a human rights-based abuse, or, uh, sorry, a human rights-based approach offers some insights into the situation and some ways to move forward. I mean, I would just argue that, you know, protection of human rights shouldn't be viewed so much as an impediment to handling the crisis, so much as an essential component of an effective crisis response. I have a couple of points in that support in uh, support of that. Uh, first, leaders who are held accountable make better decisions regarding the crisis. And, you know, it may be politically expedient to manipulate information and suppress criticism, but this ultimately has a negative impact upon both societal trust for the government, as well as the quality and breadth of information we have on the outbreak, both of which are necessary for an effective response. And you know, on a broader scale, the virus also brings out into focus the indivisible and interdependent nature of human rights. That is, it's the idea that different elements of human rights are mutually reinforcing and they should be shared across the entire population. And this has particularly been the case with labor rights as well as rights to health care. Um, these so-called positive rights are often viewed in a very skeptical manner, particularly here in America, and they're often shunted aside. But what this crisis has brought into stark focus is sort of the existential importance of the access to health care, as well as the extent to which our society depends on groups of workers whose interests are often ignored. You know, everything from farm workers to the increasing population of delivery employees. So you know, ultimately, it kind of goes back to the lessons that human rights are never politically easy to respect. And this pandemic starkly shows how short-term expediencies can often encourage putting them aside. Yet adherence to human rights at this time is necessary, is necessary for an effective and sustainable response. I think as you and Secretary General put it at one point, that you know, through respecting human rights during this crisis stage, we can build a more effective and inclusive solutions for both the emergency of today as well as the recovery of tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, you bring up a really important point, and that is that the one that human rights are not implemented um, equally across the globe or across uh, societies. And obviously um, violations of human rights have impacted some uh, more than, than others. Uh, Dr. Morgan or Dr. Zaretsky, would you like to respond and talk a little bit about the US situation on how these types of violations have affected us here um, in our own country? Who would like? You're on, on mute, Dr. Morgan. One of the things that I wanted to add initially in reading, one of the things I found is that there are three concerns about uh, how much uh, restriction, you know, how far can the government actually go, you know, so that we're not violating people's individual rights. And there are three major concerns here. One concern focuses on, you know, what kind of restrictions are to be placed? Lockdowns, curfews, and timeliness. You know, how long can we go on indefinitely? And there are some people, one of the things I'm hearing as a part of the controversy is that the timeliness, that it seems like there is an indefinite, you know, and that's kind of precipitated the protest initially. And then one of the things that I find very interesting as a criminologist is looking at precedent. There are those who wonder rights, you know, if the government assuming the right to lock down or restrict individual rights, does that set a precedent for future uh, pandemics, for future situations? Can, as Dr. Zaleski said, we are living in unprecedented times. I mean, this is very different than any of us have ever experienced. They talk a little bit, compare it a little bit to the pandemic of 1918, but certainly these are unprecedented times where we basically shut the country down. And so many are wanting to know, does this set a precedent for future and the likelihood that the country will be shut down and the restrictions can be placed on individual rights in the future? Thank you. Dr. Saretsky. 
Sure. I mean, just a couple of things. I think um, one of the things that's really extraordinary is that prior to the shutdown and the declaration of COVID-19 as a pandemic, of course, we were in the middle of a pretty heated Democratic primary in which Bernie Sanders was running largely on Medicare for all. And you saw this argument prol proliferating about how health care should be understood as a fundamental human right, right? And we're seeing that um, discourse more and more um, in support of the public option and healthcare for all. So I just think it's really almost uncanny to then have a crisis that really exemplifies the problem, right? And very quickly you had people saying that we're all only as strong as the weakest link. Um, so one of the things we're seeing is what happens to a system when you have a healthcare network that's so market driven and so organized around the markets and um, we, we heard a lot about this when we were just asking like, why aren't there enough ventilators? Why aren't there um, enough PPE for healthcare? And it's because of um, just-in-time production and changes in the markets that have really um, fundamentally altered and arguably perverted our healthcare system. So I think that's one thing that's really important to stress is just that we're seeing um, in many ways a lot of the arguments that uh, people in the Sanders campaign and other advocates for Medicare for all were making in the run-up to this pandemic, we are seeing the consequences of this. And also, of course, the ways in which the um, black and brown people, poor people, are on the, on the uh, receiving end of this virus in ways that are so disproportionate, really staggering statistics coming out all over the country that show the racial and socioeconomic disparities. The second thing that I would say that's tremendously interesting about this particular moment in terms of questions of individual liberty is um, that this is really bringing home um, in the context of this pandemic that there's no such thing really as individual liberty. So this is an argument that is so valued, considered almost sacrosanct in American culture. Um, but when you see these lockdown protesters, you know, they're not just saying, I want to go back to work. They're saying, I want to get my hair cut or I want to get a pedicure. And what that means is they're asking for society to reopen services that are going to require other workers to come in and provide those services to them. In other words, they're protesting the lockdown, not only because they want to earn wages again, um, and that's an important thing that we can talk about, but they're actually also protesting as consumers who want access to certain consumer goods that then implicate service workers. So we're in an era now, we're in a moment with this pandemic that's really kind of blowing apart um, the meaning of individual liberty and rights and really bringing into relief um, that, you know, to put it really plainly, how profoundly interconnected we all are, not just at an epidemiological level, but at a social level level like no one person can exercise their individual liberty and walk around in society if other people like the only way that that's meaningful is if others are doing it as well if there's a collective reopening of the society so those are the two points that i would stress i would like to uh, touch on something dr zareski said uh in terms of the civil rights civil rights that says that I have access to the same opportunities as everybody else, that I cannot be discriminated against, you know, because I'm a woman, because I'm black, because of uh, some of the other things, I have a disability or whatever the case might be, that I have access to the same opportunities. You cannot discriminate against me. So one of the things that I look at is I raise a question, are there civil rights violations here? With this pandemic, are there human rights violations? And I say absolutely yes. So when I look at the disproportionality of deaths uh, in the black community, absolutely so. Uh, I was looking at data and I found out, I looked at 27% that African Americans, blacks comprise 13% of the US population, but 27% of the deaths from coronavirus. Uh, I also noticed that in one in one state, for every 100,000 African Americans, there are 92 deaths, and this is far more than um, other races. And so, disproportionality uh, absolutely exists. And so, when we look at it, we look at some of the underlying conditions. Of the civil rights lifestyle, but that's not always the case. When you look at underlying poverty, for example, uh, poverty. 10% of Americans are live below the 
poverty level. However, when you look at African Americans and Hispanics, uh, 20 percent of African Americans live below the poverty level. And so contributing factor. Uh, in Alabama, 27 percent of African Americans live below the poverty level. So where we live, where we work, and we look at many of the essential workers, uh, doctors, nurses, chairs, what they, you know, they have an oath. But when we look at managers, when we look at service workers, when we look at people who are in essential positions that help to keep society running, even in a shutdown, uh, many of those are people from marginalized groups. And so conditions, they are exposed to conditions that really exacerbate uh, the problems and the exposure to the pandemic, to coronavirus. So absolutely disproportionality. I also looked at uh, people with disabilities. Uh, people with disabilities do not have the same access to uh, health care. Uh, I read um, where in some instances the guidelines specify that only health care can be provided, health care services can be provided, be provided to individuals once they assess the level of impairment, the life expectancy, and the survival rate, the likelihood of survival becomes a way to discriminate against those with disabilities. Uh, looking at those in prisons, uh, that has been a big issue. And as a criminologist, I'm absolutely interested in that. Uh, people in prisons, you know, there's a density, population density. There is um, no opportunity for social distancing. Uh, they're not entitled to have sanitizer because of the alcohol contained in hand sanitizer. And so consequently, you know, it creates a situation where there is the spread, there's a proliferation uh, and the spread of the coronavirus. Uh, some jails are now releasing people. Uh, prisons have started to do the same. But again, to me, that's not just a civil rights issue, but it is a, a human rights issue as well. Yes, no, I think that this is a very good point. I mean, the, We've heard a lot of times people saying, oh, we're in this together, but that's not actually the case because um, if you're rich, if you're powerful uh, economically or politically, the experience is, is a very different one and the kinds of human rights violations that you face um, are, are very different. And, um, I want to just, um, before we get to the community questions, pick up on one point that Dr. Blanton uh, made, and that is the, the sort of centralization of power, the use of this pandemic or public crisis public, um, or disasters uh, to centralize power in one person. Um, can you talk a little bit more um, about that? Yeah, um, you know, it's not unusual politically for a country for a leader to use any type of any type of shock or any time of crisis to centralize power. I mean, the most recent example in the U.S. I think I would say you know is the global war on terror, right? We used that that security threat was the rationale to centralize power in the executive branch. And the problem with those kind of things is it's kind of a ratchet effect, right? It goes in one direction. The power goes up, but it doesn't tend to go back down, right? Um, this is the first time we've seen that kind of effect uh, in place with any sort of health pot, with any type, any other type of crisis. And it's kind of an odd dynamic because at one hand, on one hand, you have this, this push uh, to centralize power, but on the other hand, it does show the weaknesses in our existing power structure um, in terms of can this government provide services for its people? Can this government do what needs to be done? So you've seen kind of a weird sort of contrast with on the one hand, trying to centralize information, but on the other hand, not providing the services, the goods and services that the country should provide. So it's been kind of an odd dynamic. And I think what you've seen in terms of just a really gross uh, centralizations of power, a lot of that has been in countries where sort of semi-democracies anyway, uh, in your Hungary's, your Turkey's, and things like that, or in the autocracies such as China. And you know, Russia is using it as an excuse to centralize power. Uh, Hungary is the most extreme example, but there, there's a lot of cases of that happening pretty much worldwide. Thank you. I want to make sure we have some time um, to 
uh, talk about your uh, comments. So thank you all who, who have sent us questions for our panelists, either before the event or during our conversation. Um, this is a question someone wrote on Facebook, and I would say it's probably uh, most appropriate uh, for Dr. Blanton. Um, it's a two-part question, so I'm just going to put them together and you can answer it however um, you feel comfortable. So uh, during this pandemic, the U.S. fell drastically behind the rest of the world in terms of response and taking care of its citizen. Part one of the question is, would you say now is a good time for the U.S. to join the United Nations in guaranteeing health care and food as a positive human right? Um, or positive human rights. And then part two, what about labor rights? They are always tenuous to non-existence in the U.S., and, but especially hard hit right now as the U.S. and other countries let them slide further under the rug, risking worker safety while they're at it as part of their coronavirus response. I know we, we mentioned part two already a little bit, but maybe you can um, expand. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Let me, let me kind of cut that up into, into parts here. Yeah, I mean, human rights entails that a state is supposed to provide certain services and goods for its people that can enjoy, so they can enjoy a basic level of existence. And also that a state is supposed to stop itself from engaging in things that hurt its people's uh, that directly hurt its people. So it's got what we call positive and negative rights. A state agrees to provide stuff and a state agrees not to do things. And I think what this crisis has brought into, into focus with the U.S. is the very mediocre job that our country does in providing the positive rights. I mean, we are, I mean, students are surprised to hear that healthcare is actually a human right. And that's not just an opinion, that's international law on the subject where the U.S. is very much an outlier in this regard. Um, so it does put that in sort of stark focus with where we stand the rest of the world regarding the rest of the world and, you know, just on an existential basis, how important it is to do that. And, and labor rights, you know, labor rights have always had tenuous support in the U.S., particularly the past few decades. Um, I mean, in addition to the weakness of our labor unions here in the country, we always fall behind our peer countries in terms of wage levels, working conditions, a whole lot of things like that. And it's really interesting to me that this crisis has brought attention to a lot of large portion of our workforce that's typically ignored or taken for granted. I mean, many of the employees that, that our country's relying on right now that are called heroes right now, uh, warehouse employees, meatpacking workers, and things like that, they're not paid that much, and, and they work in pretty dangerous conditions. Uh, it was a horrible case of the meat pie, uh, I think it was Tyson in Iowa, uh, where it was, it was in April, and the employees are working shoulder to shoulder, um, you know, in very long hours, and lo and behold, a lot of them started getting sick. So it's starting to bring some attention to these workers. And on the good side, what you've seen is some type of lip service given to improving some labor conditions, and in some cases, actually increasing wages. You know, my problem personally is I don't think the U.S. has the institutional structure to make those changes stick. But I think once popular attention comes off these heroes, then it's gonna go back to the status quo. Uh, it would be nice if something changes, but that's, that's really, it's hard not to be a little cynical in that regard that absent some type of structural change, you wonder if the short-term attention span being paid to healthcare into labor rights is going to amount to any change. Maybe if I may, a quick follow up question to that. Like if somebody who is, you know, interested in pushing these types of, of positive human rights, whether it be healthcare or labor rights, what would you advise them to do? <laughs> like what are some of the, the things that, I know this is a hard question. I don't expect like you to have to, to catalog, right? But just like, what are some of your thoughts? I mean, you've, you've seen a lot more about uh, healthcare in sort of the public agenda and in a public forum as opposed to labor rights. You very rarely hear much of anything about labor rights. It's very episodic and the American public pays attention to it. I do think that you're seeing the discussion on healthcare head in direction that's heading sort of towards what we're talking about, this idea of viewing healthcare as a human right. So there can be some room for optimism there. And I think a lot of that to me is just how healthcare is framed, right? I think a lot of people view healthcare as something that people have the right to take or not to take. And I think that getting reframed as something that everyone has by virtue of being in a society, uh, just changing the way healthcare is viewed is, can accomplish a lot. I mean, framing an issue really matters. And I think you've started to 
see more and more people viewing healthcare as a human right. And that, that to me is good news. Labor rights is, is a little bit further along. The US as a whole has an, has an aversion to labor unions. So I don't think collective bargaining, collective bargaining is imperfect in terms of popular support and you can't always rely on the goodwill of corporations. So that's a, that's a, a little tougher sell. Thank you. Um, this is a question, well, it's, I kind of combined them. One came from Twitter, one came uh, from uh, Facebook. And uh, I'm gonna start with Dr. Zaretsky on this one. I'm just gonna read it. Um, it's easy to think um, of the two sides during this pandemic as people who resent not being able to shop or eat versus people who are afraid that they will die. But how do you draw the line between what different groups want and how do you decide which voices are listened to? And sort of related to that, when you, ha when you have one side pushing for more restrictions and one side um, pushing against, how can a government make both sides feel that they're being heard? How, is there a way to uh, diffuse this resentment? Yeah, let me start with the um, final question about diffusing. I think a big part of the problem that we're encountering right now is that we have a political um, administration, a presidential administration, that's doing the opposite of diffusing the tension, right? He's ratcheting up. The Trump administration is very um, self-consciously and strategically ratcheting up this rhetoric of division. So what I mentioned at the outset, which is that polling data shows certainly differences between Democrats and Republicans on the question about the reopening. Um, but actually shows that a majority of Americans are in fact taking the virus seriously um, and trying to do what they can to stop the spread. So I think that unfortunately, again, because we're living in this time of intense polarization, um, we're not seeing um, a kind of diffusing of the tension. And I think one of the things the Trump administration has been attempting to do is to sort of pitch this as a populist class struggle between working class Americans who just want to get back to work, and then these coastal elites who have the luxury of, of moving to work at home. And actually, I think there is an important conversation to be had about that. Like, there is an information finance economy that is able to, to work from home or telecommute or whatever. And then there are all sorts of essential workers that we're seeing who don't have the luxury of doing that. So when um, Trump sort of mobilizes that populist rhetoric, um, he's kind of capitalizing on something that's real, a real dynamic. But in fact, um, it's, it's working class people who are really raising a lot of concerns about the safety of reopening. We wouldn't know it right now because it doesn't get as much media attention, but there are actually labor uprisings underway all the time in the context of the pandemic. There have been a series of one day walkouts at places like Instacart and Amazon. Again, these things don't get the same kind of publicity and media coverage as you see uh, with militia groups armed storming the Capitol in Michigan. They're just not as sort of media um, mediagenic, we might say, but they are happening and they're quite extraordinary because as Professor Blanton pointed out, the labor movement in the United States has been decimated really over the last several decades. So you do see um, workers fighting back. In fact, at the meat production plants, uh, the meat packing plants that Professor Blanton was referring to, you had protesters um, outside those plants raising concerns about reopening the economy. Many of them are the children of the workers in those plants. So I think, and in terms of like how to diffuse the tension, you know, I think um, it's really important to listen. Like one thing pediatricians have said about when they encounter uh, parents who are wary of vaccines or the vaccine schedule is to be respectful, to try to understand what it is they're afraid of, um, and then to just try to very patiently and calmly convey relevant information. I think we see public health leaders doing their absolute best uh, to do that. I think trying to understand, you know, people's fears about the economy right now are very legitimate. I don't know exactly what the latest statistic is on unemployment. It's something like 36 million Americans. It's astonishing. We're in um, a very, very dire period economically. And I think so, I think there are a lot of Americans who have concerns about this that are very uh, valid, but I think it requires cutting through a lot of the chatter you see on, on social media and um, sort of lowering the temperature of the rhetoric. And unfortunately, the leadership we have in place right now is seems intent on doing the absolute 
opposite of that. So it's an extremely volatile and worrying um, situation in that in that regard. Thank you. Like uh, Dr. Blank, do you want to respond? Yeah, I would sort of uh, in response to your. I, w I was sort of, we're not, the U.S. is not the only country to have that kind of divisiveness and those kind of conspiratorial approaches uh, to the pandemic. I, I've been surprised because, you know, like, like probably y'all have seen all kinds of conspiracy theories going on about the pandemic. Uh, and this isn't just a U.S. thing. I was surprised, for example, there's a big theory in Europe that five, the uh, 5G uh, cell phone towers, that, that is what is actually spreading the coronavirus. And, you know, actually cell phone towers in Europe have been destroyed. Uh, so we're not the only country that has those forces of divisiveness within it. We are somewhat unusual in terms of the role that our leadership plays in that divisiveness. Uh, but those kind of elements are, we're not the only, we're not an exception uh, with regard to that part of it. Thank you. Like, um, the, the, the question of who do we listen to, you met, uh, Dr. Zaretsky, you mentioned the, the workers um, and not getting enough attention on you know, their walkouts and those kinds of things. I mean, are these um, you know, activities working to change policy? Like, do we, see, do we see policy changes based on what's happening already? Um, it, it doesn't seem to me like we're seeing real changes in labor policies at the moment. Um, I agree with Professor Blanton that I think um, in some ways because there was already a kind of public dialogue, a public debate going about Medicare for all, I'm hoping that we'll see changes um, in healthcare. Um, I mean, I would just say one other thing. Um, it, it's, it's sort of an indirect answer to your question, but I think it's an important that what that builds on what Professor Blanton was saying earlier. I find this rhetoric around her heroism and heroes, um, I find it actually disturbing. I think it's sentimentalizing. I mean, it, it's, it's a way of sort of um, tugging on people's heartstrings about workers, essential workers. But, you know, I read a letter um, from someone who works in healthcare and he was saying, you know, we're not on the front lines. We're not, this isn't actually a war. People use metaphors of war to describe this, but this is actually about safe working conditions. And I feel that the language of heroism and the metaphors of war are actually obfuscating the kinds of analysis that we need over the long term to actually implement policies and changes in labor law, for example, um, that are permanent. I wish I could be more optimistic. I'm more optimistic on the healthcare side of things. I do feel like healthcare policy is being foregrounded now, partly because of the debates that were going on prior to the arrival of the pandemic that make me more guardedly optimistic about that. Thank you. Um, we got a comment to your opening statement, Dr. Morgan. Um, there seems to be some more interest in knowing what the US government and state governments legally can do to limit liberty in this pandemic. Um, could we go as far as Asian governments did? And at what point would this be un unconstitutional? And then related to that, could violations of COVID-19 orders become a crime treated like reckless driving, for example? You're, sorry, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, let me deal with the last question uh, first. There are certain public laws that are designed for public safety. Uh, uh, things like seat belts, um, no texting while driving. They are designed to promote public safety and that is to protect everybody. And so, yes, those laws can be punished by fines, by jail time. Um, yes, they can be, not necessarily, I don't think they can be, but it's a matter of enforcing that in many instances, even though that there are laws against prohibiting that, I don't think that there will be um, people put in jail, you know, because of the failure to wear a face mask. One of the things that does concern me is the um, disparity in the enforcement of these rules and regulations. And so what I've seen is that um, in some neighborhoods, 
uh, police are more aggressive in their tactics to uh, gain compliance to the rules, not wearing a face mask. They are more um, aggressive in marginalized communities, uh, very aggressive with particularly black males. Uh, one, one story showed where in one community, in one marginalized community, they were um, using aggressive tactics, uh, tackling you know, black males, dragging them, arresting them because they were not in compliance. Uh, they showed the other scene uh, in New York where police were, you know, people were not social distancing. They were not, you know, wearing face masks and police were handing out face masks. So that's one of the concerns about the enforcement of those rules and regulations, uh, the disparity of which, with which police, um, you know, enforce those regulations. The other thing that concerns me about the enforcement is uh, racial profiling that increases the likelihood for racial profiling. And many black males are concerned about wearing the mask, just really increases the likelihood of racial profiling. And racial profiling is using race as a proxy for dangerousness. And so many are concerned about that. There have been some incidents of racial profiling where black males have been stopped and handcuffed. You know, wearing a mask, in the becomes, and they were handing out testing, they were testing, uh, in communities, in marginalized communities. So there are some real issues when it comes to that, uh, the racial profiling. Um, and so I don't really, uh, we are a democracy, so I don't think that we would impose the same kind or enforce the re regulations, uh, the rules in the same way as an Asian country. Uh, because we, you know, we're a democracy and we believe in you know, popular sovereignty, and so consequently, I don't see that same kind of enforcement, but there are some difficulties, you know, with enforcement of the rules and regulations, but we need those, we need those. Those are administrative laws and they're designed for public safety, and we don't question those. I mean, there's no, you know, men's ray, there's no proving I didn't intend to, you know, not wear a face mask, because these are laws that are designed to uh, protect the public, protect everybody. And so I don't see the same kind of enforcement strategies in America as you see in some of the other countries. You know, I was reading you know, censorship, you know, those kinds of things. We don't have those, you know, kinds of things here. But certainly there are some concerns in the way that these um, restrictions are enforced. Thank you. Yeah, it seems like um, this discussion, safety versus liberty, will be with us uh, for for some some time, and hopefully we can, you know, continue our discussion. Unfortunately, we're um, currently out of time. I would like to thank you all for this fascinating and important discussion, um, and for sharing your expertise and time and talent with uh, with us. I would also like to thank all the viewers uh, who followed along on Facebook and YouTube and those who sent us comments and questions. Let us know if you have additional comments or questions or ideas for topics you'd like to have uh, covered. Uh, you can contact us here on our Facebook page or also by email at ihr at uab.edu. Thank you all and have a wonderful night.